Thanks, Gio, and thanks, George, for such a lovely talk. So, um, as George alluded to, with the time we have allotted, I'm going to talk a little bit more about principles, because I think a lot of the techniques, because I'm not sure this is the right audience for talking about going in and dissecting out vessels in the sidewall, um, a lot of the techniques and concepts have been discussed by others. So this is more a principle-related talk uh, about going beyond TME. Uh, disclosures don't relate to this. Um, and it is because, and as we've heard earlier, the concept of total mesorectal excision changes outcomes. Okay, so this is just a look at several papers out of Stockholm, Stockholm 1 and 2 studies, a group of Swedish surgeons who had a significant focus on rectal cancer, but they had end colostomy rates of around 60%, reminiscent of our recent US data, and local recurrence rates of around 20%. And by changing into the TME era, all of those things changed. 27% ankylostomy, 8% local recurrence, and they had a survival improvement, which they hadn't seen. And that's been seen now in other data sets. So that's largely driven, as you've heard from all the talks, or talks have talked around the point, of having a negative circumferential margin. So the concept of local recurrence being related to the distance of the tumor from the circumferential margin is the key. So the key isn't actually, you know, we've moved on a little bit. The key isn't actually just doing a TME. The key is doing a TME for somebody having rectal cancer surgery as long as you know by preoperative imaging that the margins will be clear. And if they're not, you go beyond TME. Because at the end of the day, whether it's a grade three mesorectum or a grade three mesorectum plus another anatomical structure, the goal is that negative circumferential resection margin. So looking across the US, and this is a, a variety of papers published not that long ago, you can see the local recurrence rates were in the high 20s and 30%. If you look at an individual, and this is someone sent in recently with a perineal recurrence after an APR, obviously these are disabling and smelly and tough ways to die because that's what happens. So if we look at the incidence of these really advanced or locally recurrent tumors, there's probably about 5,000 patients a year in the US. They have terrible median survivals. They have horrible complications, often of their previous surgery, but at least of their disease. Pain is a really significant feature. And many or most have exhausted other treatment options. But if they're evaluated properly, they can often be treated. So this is a paper that I think a number of us in the, the faculty and perhaps some others in the, the audience as well were involved in, but this was a Beyond TME collaborative, which was an international group of 79 surgeons from a number of countries, uh, a number of continents, that had 50 statements that we evaluated and voted on, and more than two-thirds of those statements we had greater than 95% consensus. Because a lot of the statements that we had to look at aren't based on level one evidence, and this is the best that we could do at the time. The evidence has improved a little over that time, but not a lot. A lot of these questions are things that are just really hard to study. So as a brief summary, the clear consensus was that, just like rectal cancer, but within that rectal cancer cohort, these kind of cases need to be managed by people who have multidisciplinary teams, so they can be appropriately diagnosed, staged, assessed, and managed. So I thought I'd pick out a couple of, there's 51, which is too many, but I'd pick out a couple of the key statements of the group. Um, so some of the preoperative uh, key statements uh, were that the ideal diagnosis of, so P or C is primary rectal cancer, BTME is beyond TME. So this is a locally invasive primary cancer that's into bladder, vagina, sidewall, other organ structure, okay? So P or C, BTME, or recurrent rectal cancer. Because really, when we're going to manage these, as long as we can curatively manage them, the local surgical management's going to be the same. It's the goal of getting that negative surgical circumferential margin, and the concept that doing a TME on these people, no matter how perfect you make it look, is the wrong operation because you haven't gone wide enough. So yes, TME is important, 
but TME doesn't matter if it wasn't enough for that patient. So 97% consensus around that. The multidisciplinary team requires surgical, oncological, radiological, pathological um, expertise in pelvic exenteration, among other things, with a record and track record, 86%. Patients with either advanced primary cancers or recurrent cancers should be considered for referral to a subspecialized multidisciplinary team, 93% and 4% respectively. I put the percentages in. The first percent relates to the primary rectal cancer. The second relates to the recurrent rectal cancer, but you can see there's high concordance between both. The optimum modality for imaging is MRI. We saw that lovely talk earlier on. And further research into the added value and cost effectiveness of PET-CT is required before routine use can be recommended, 80%. So they're the pre-op ones, just as a taster. The absolute contraindications to resectability include so 2C overall, poor performance status. These beyond TME operations are generally not things we'll do on unfit people, except maybe an exenteration. That's the lower end of the spectrum for these cases. Bilateral sciatic nerve involvement, circumferential bone involvement, and then relative contraindications of tumor going through the sciatic notch, encasement of the external iliac vessels requiring an on-block resection, high sacral involvement as opposed to low, unresectable distant metastasis, and a predicted or 2 resection. Because you should be able to predict on your preoperative imaging if you're not going to be able to get an, an adequate margin. This is not something you find out in the operating room, oh, we're going to have to take an iliac, or oh, we're going to have to take sacrum. You've got to predict it. So if in the operating room you're getting a positive margin, that's a failure of your preoperative management. And so obviously there are more points on that, I'll just address you to the manuscript which was published five years ago in the British Journal of Surgery. It's a, it's a, a good paper. So we've heard about optimal imaging with MRI. It gives us the highest resolution imaging of these spaces. We've seen other speakers show beautiful pictures around it, so I'm not going to go into it, except to say that this allows the radiologist, and then in partnership with the surgical team, demonstrate the tumor-free planes so we've planned our operation before we go into the operating room, okay? So we're not going in for a surprise of saying, oh, maybe prostate's involved, or oh, levators, vagina, what have you, sacrum, coccyx are involved. This should all be planned and not unexpected. What's a difficult dissection? Well, we've heard of some of it, um, narrow male pelvis, but there's other complexities when we're talking about recurrent or reoperative cancers. And that's the distortion of the anatomical planes from inflammation or fibrosis or scar. Prior or current injury or adherence to pelvic structures listed there. Multivisceral involvement. Or if you're dealing with a local recurrence because it's scar plus tumor, uh, whether it's after local or radical excision. So there's a number of papers in the literature thinking beyond TME of multivisceral resections for rectal cancer. This is one of ours. I had a case before I left there. Um, and suffice it to say that even though we're trying to do all of these things, these are complicated patients. And our local recurrence rate was higher than our 3% for our normal rectal cancer cohort, or overall, because that included this. But for these, it's around 10%. And the five-year survival wasn't as high as we expected. So the candidates for these kind of surgeries are a little bit different. There are a lot of candidates. We know that local recurrence are high in certain places. I mentioned there's probably about 5,000 cases a year in the US, and there probably are a number of places that have 20-ish percent or higher recurrence rates for rectal cancer, similar to some of the not too distant papers I showed you earlier. And so if you multiply it out, there's a lot of potential for doing a correct operation for these people with recurrent cancers. When it recurs, these are the patterns of recurrence that we notice usually, generally close to the anastomosis. Not a great surprise, uh, particularly when you see some of the postoperative imaging of residual mesorectum, things like that. Most of them start in the perirectal tissue, so a colonoscopy doesn't necessarily find all of these. You can see the percentage starting at the anastomosis, the percentage posterior, and the percentage that are circumferential. 
And so if you look at the anatomical pattern of recurrence, the majority are posterior central, and you can see the other distribution there. And each of those brings individual complexities with how you're going to take it out. And if you look at this imaging, obviously you've got a recurrent tumor filling a pelvis where all margins are threatened at least. And then you've also got to deal with the physical bulk of what you remove. And somebody who may have had a complete course of chemoradiation previously. So the planning is critical. You've got to have the right imaging so you know what you're getting into. You have to have the right team. You've got to have the intra and preoperative steps set up so it's not a surprise during surgery. If you need gynonc, urology, orthopedics, vascular, and you've got to have your reconstruction planned, uh, as George so showed so nicely. You've got to interpret your imaging so the evolution is away from CT and towards MRI so you can get an accurate anatomical understanding of the planes. And by getting that understanding, you can pick the right specialists who are at your multidisciplinary tumor board and say which guys need to be in for which case next week. So it's all planned and it's not a surprise. By having the team that functions well, then you get over all the hurdles of somebody who hasn't seen something before, getting multiple consultants in last minute, the time to treat, because if you don't have it planned to get all the people in the right room at the right time, takes time. So the goal then is this OR0 resection, accepting that in a small number of patients you'll have an OR1 resection, but not an OR2. Jord nicely showed the wideness of the perineal resection and how you tailor that to the tumor, taking the levators, taking the floor and vagina, but not having a positive margin. So, but you have to pick your extra mesorectal plane, whether it's levators, whether it's lateral sidewall, whether it's anterolateral. And so on this patient, for example, you do a nice TME, it's not gonna help the patient because there's a node outside your TME. So it's all about the preoperative planning and deciding whether posterior, we're gonna be looking at sacrum, knowing that before we go into surgery, looking at bladder, what have you. There are a couple of nice papers that give algorithms for evaluation uh, talking about imaging outside the abdomen and pelvis, what you need to rule out before you operate. MRI of the pelvis, what you're looking for. And selectively, when you should use uh, PET scanning. Uh, and Mirna Zami and colleagues, and this is a group out of Leeds, Pete Sagar, who does a lot of this kind of surgery as well. Um, the algorithms of thought processes that they go through. And so as I mentioned, concentrate mainly on the algorithms and the thought process. Knowing that the lateral side is the most challenging and slightly different pathways. Because when you're thinking lateral, we're talking iliacs, we're talking piriformis, we're talking sciatic nerve. And so those are things that many surgeons aren't familiar with and you shouldn't be rushing into in an unexpected fashion. The perineum, whatever form you get access in, the goal is, as George showed you, to do this nice wide local excision and not of those terrible local recurrences uh, like I showed you in the early imaging that really were surgical failures. And then if you have to go to bone, you go to bone. And you take bone and you decide this is all planned preoperatively. And so here a partial say correct to me. But again, it's all planned preoperatively so we know when we're going at this level, we're going to have a negative margin. We saw about perineal closure. It's critical. So again, it's one of the specialty group that you need involved in your multidisciplinary group um, before you approach these cases. IORT is an interesting option. It's something some centers have. It can be an interesting option, but only when you think you're not going to get a negative margin with a proper operation. This is not a rescue for a bad operation. This is something you can add on for highly selective cases, maybe at the sacral promontory, things that you can't resect. So it's an exit strategy um, that is useful, but not something that's a crutch for a bad operation. So this was a recent Cleveland Clinic experience that we've looked at that I won't dive into. And in fact, I'll just leave with the last two slides, which are uh, the last paper that I'll leave in your mind by Yang and colleagues that came out a couple of years ago in DCNR, which was a pelvic exenteration systematic review, very nice paper, just showing you the morbidity and complication rates in these patients. 37 to 100% complication rates, 0 to 25% mortality rates, 4 to 60% local recurrence rates, by surgeons who thought they were experienced doing this, and are, 
these are challenging cases. And most recently, the Pelvex Collaborative, which is a follow-through of that um, Beyond TME Collaborative that we had from 27 centers, again, showing the high mortality, 2%, high complication rate, 30%, and survival and outcome rate. So there's an increasing amount of data in the literature showing the complexity of these cases, um, showing that these cases you have to get a negative margin to get good survival. Bone resection is often a good marker because it's a group that are able to do these challenging resections and get those negative margins. And we now have consensus statements to show what you should do and how you should do it. So in conclusion, a multidisciplinary team is critical. You need super specialists available. You've got to plan this preoperatively. There should be no intraoperative surprises. Yes, these are high morbidity cases, but as long as you predict that you can get a negative margin, these are patients who we can sometimes offer cure to. So if it's isolated, if it's diagnosed early, if it's treated aggressively with the goal of negative margins, these patients can do very well. Thank you.